It's the Opperman Report. And now, here is investigator Ed Opperman. Okay, welcome to the Opperman Report. I'm your host, private investigator Ed Opperman. You could find me at Opperman Investigations and Digital Forensic Consulting, uh, either at my website, emailrevealer.com, or you can just email me directly at oppermaninvestigations at gmail.com. If you like this show today and you want to hear more, we put up about eight hours of new content on Patreon, the Opperman Report Patreon, uh, each month, and plus a lot of free content we put up there as well. And you can also hear these shows that you hear Monday to Friday on AMFM Radio. You can hear them on there with the, with the ads edited out, ad-free. Also, to our archives, you can always find on Spreaker.com. You can go there, sign up for free, and uh, there's a, you get an email notification when we put up new content, and there's also a chat room where you can discuss the shows with other listeners. I'm really excited about our guest today. We have today a piece of history. We have Buell Wesley Frazier, and he's written the book, Steering Truth, My, external, my Eternal Connection to JFK and Lee Harvey Oswald. Mr. Frazier is the young man who drove Lee Harvey Oswald to the Texas Book Depository building on the day of the assassination. Uh, he's just written this book. You can get it on Amazon.com, or you can go on Facebook and put in Buell Wesley Frazier, and you'll get his Facebook page. Mr. Frazier, are you there? I am here. Thank you so much. Before we get into the whole JFK story and Oswald, tell us about yourself. Who is Buell Wesley Frazier? Well, first of all, Bill Wesley Frazier uh, is just a very uh, common man. Um, he uh, talks softly, uh, walks lightly, and um, he admires the things that's going on around him. Um, we have a beautiful country, and even though we've recently gone through this um uh, terrible phase with the COVID-19 mm. uh, and a lot of businesses have been closed down and some will never open but hopefully they will um, we've gone through a rough time in the last uh, little over a year but hopefully America is on the way back and um, I'm just a uh, as I said I'm a simple man but the story um, is stirring truth is a lot more and curtain rods and rides to and from Dallas, Texas, with Lee Harvey Oswald. And about myself, um, I, at that time, uh, in November uh, 22, 1963, I was just a young uh, 19-year-old boy from a very small rural town in south, uh, deep southeast Texas. Uh, the uh, town uh, is called Huntsville, Texas. Uh, it was so small back then that we didn't even have red lights. Had a few stop signs, and um, it was very uh, slow pace. And at that time, uh, I didn't know any different because that's the way I grew up. Um, I had an opportunity to come to Dallas-Fort Worth area. Matter of fact, uh, Irving, Texas. Uh, my sister and her husband and three daughters invited me to uh, come up and live with them while I was seeking employment. And in doing so, um, I did find uh, employment with a company called Texas School Book Depository uh, in Dallas, Texas. And I started to work there, and um, uh, I remember the day I went over for my interview, I uh, interviewed with a um, with a man by the name of Mr. Roy Truly, and he was telling me, he said, well, this is really hard work. Well, Mr. Truly didn't know my background and where I came from. Hard work was a normal thing. So he uh, told me to come back that afternoon, and I started to work, and um, everything went quite well. Um, and um, being able to learn very quickly greatly helped me. Um, Let me ask you a been, question. Uh, exactly what what was the purpose? You know, we always hear about the school book depository, but what was the purpose of this building? What did they do there? What kind of business? 
Okay, the type of uh, business we did there at the Texas School Book Depository was that uh, we shipped uh, textbooks, anything from a kindergarten level uh, to a doctor's degree in college. Um, and we shipped to five states. The five states were Texas, New Mexico, Oklahoma, Arkansas, and Louisiana. Uh, and we did, uh, and our customers were um, public schools and colleges and individual teachers. So we had a very uh, good business. And at that time, um, all the major publishers in the Dallas, uh, Texas were in that one building. And that one building, I'd like to uh, enlighten the listener that, and it's hard to know this if you just walk up outside the building today, um, the uh, building had uh, seven uh, floors and a basement, and on certain um, on certain floors were certain publishers. And give you an example, um, the fifth floor uh, we had the largest pub- publisher on that floor was uh, a company called Southwestern Publishing. Now on the sixth floor, which people are very well familiar with and hear about. On that floor, the largest publisher on that floor was a company called Scotch Foreman uh, Publishing. And uh, and we shipped uh, to the five states I mentioned, but we also could ship to a a state out of that area if another, um, if the publishing company found out that maybe whoever they normally uh, order their books from in their area was uh, out or could not supply, then it would come to our office and we would ship to that location wherever it was. So we were quite busy and uh, we had a small crew, but everyone worked very well together because we had to. That was the way it was. So let me ask you this. Uh, How did you wind up meeting Mr. Oswald? Okay, the way I I ended up meeting uh, Lee Harvey Oswald was that uh, I had been working there at Texas School Book Depository uh, just a little over a month. And uh, uh, we had um, uh, our speakers on all the floors. Uh, my supervisor, Mr. Shelley, uh, he called and asked me to come to his office. So I stopped what I was doing, and uh, I took the freight elevator down to the uh, first floor and reported to Mr. Shelley's office. Well, while I, was, while I was walking up, I noticed Mr. Shelley was outside his office, and he had a young man there with him. Uh, so when I, uh, I walked up, Mr. Shelley said, uh, and I went by Wesley then. Uh, he said, Wesley, he said, this is Lee. He's going to be working with us. And I said, we're glad to have you. And so Mr. Shelley said, I want you to take him and teach him to fill orders as well as you. And I said, yes, sir, I'll do my best. So for the next three or four days, um, uh, Lee was like my shadow. He was everywhere I would go, he'd be with me. And he watched how I uh, went about filling the orders. And the thing that I'd like to uh, uh, enlighten people with that um, Lee was always on time. Uh, he was a good worker. He was a fast learner. He never uh, he never asked the same question over and over. Uh, his questions were good, and um, so after about Wait, let, let me ask you uh, this: Did he seem overqualified for the job? Um, no, but I think he was. Um, I think he was very smart, and he uh, showed me that. Uh, by the questions he would ask me and by the, um, the sentence structure, the words in his mm-hmm. sentences. Uh, I knew that uh, he had he had some form of education higher than uh, a lot of people that worked there. But that never did, that never did phase our relationship. It was strictly business and I enjoyed working with him. And like I uh, said, Previously, he was a fast learner. After about three or four days, uh, I was riding into work, and I said, well, let's see what this guy's learned. So when I got to work, I got a clipboard, 
and I put some of the easier orders that I normally filled on my clipboard. And I said, uh, this morning, I said, we're going to find out uh, what you've learned. And I said, and so he took the clipboard, and he didn't shy away. Um, and I told him, I said, see if you can fill these. And I said, if you have any questions, I said, just find me, and I'll stop, and we'll go over your order, and I'll explain it to the best of my ability, and uh, you'll be fine. Well, he did very well. And uh, and as time went on, Mr. Shelley was very proud of the way that I was teaching him and the way he was uh, retaining. And what people must remember, if you work in a distribution center, um, nowadays, uh, the way things come off and orders are printed off, it tells you exactly where to go uh, to what row or what level right. to pull an item. Well, back then, uh, in 1963, we were just computer, uh, computers were just beginning to edge onto the market. It was a new thing. A lot of people didn't know anything about them. But um, when the orders would come into uh, School Book Depository, uh, according to the publisher, uh, we had uh, young women working at the desk. They would take the orders, and uh, and then they would uh, go and um, type up the invoice, and it would run off on the uh, computer, and uh, not the computer, but the printer. And they would take and tear them off and bring them downstairs to uh, Mr. Shelley. He would go over the orders, and then he would take and separate them and put them into different boxes for different order fillers, uh, according to the publisher. And uh, and I find it so, thinking about that, uh, you had to have a really good memory of where things were, what right. floors they were on, and be able to go and get the, the uh, book or the amount of books that the order called for on that particular title, and you had to be quick about it. Uh, um, let me uh, ask you a couple of questions. How much time transpired from the, the first day Mr. Oswald uh, was employed at the school book depository until uh, the day of the assassination? Um, just a little over a month. One month. Now, did it seem uh, to... Well, I said just a little over. I think um, he he started to work there at the depository, I think, around the middle of the month in October. And uh, the assassination occurred on the 22nd of November. So the middle of uh, October to the 22nd of November is just a little over a month. Gotcha. Uh, now, in your interaction with him, did it appear that he was interested in keeping this job and perhaps rising up in the company? Did he have an interest in, in uh, staying with this company long term? Did he ask about retirement benefits, things like that? Uh, no, sir. He never did. No. Okay. I like the uh, I like the listener to understand that uh, Lee was not a uh, person that would initiate a conversation. He mm -hmm. wasn't talkative. Uh, but if you asked him a question, he was always very polite and he would answer you. And um, being that he didn't talk very much, the thing that he would talk more to me about was um, his children. And by that I mean uh, Marina, um, and he already had one child, a girl, and Marina was expecting a second child, which turned out to be another girl. But um, he would, when he would uh, ride home with me on Friday afternoon and then come back with me on Monday morning, um, Marina was living with a lady in Irving, Texas, uh, by the name of Ruth Payne. And uh, Ruth Payne was... Um, home was only about a half a block up the street from where I was living with my my sister and her husband and the three girls. So uh, during the, when I dropped him off in front of the house on Friday afternoon, even though I was a young boy, I realized that um, he was coming out to see his family, and I didn't want to interfere in that. Gotcha. Uh, now, um, Sometimes people say, well, did you ever stop on the way home on Friday afternoon and, and have a, uh, a burger and a beer? We never did anything like that. Uh, my relationship with Lee was strictly 
uh, business professional at work. Well, let me let me we ask never, you this: How did it come about that you started giving him a ride? Well, the way that uh, occurred was that the first day he uh, was there working, um, <clears throat> he um, he told me that um, uh, that he lived in Dallas, but his wife was living out in Irving with a lady called Miss Payne. And I didn't ask him why he lived in Dallas because I consider that was none of my business. Mm -hmm. I just left that alone. But uh, he asked me, could um, could he ride out to um, Irving with me? And I said, sure. You can go any day you want to, anytime you want to go, just tell me. And that way when I leave in the afternoon, I'll know not to leave without without you. And so we come to that conclusion that he would ride home with me on uh, Friday afternoon and come back with me on Monday morning. As I said uh, earlier, I drop him off in front of um, Mrs. Payne's house on Friday afternoon. But then on Monday morning, a lot of times I would be, I would pick him up in front of the house. Sometimes I might have to blow the horn. Or he would be coming out the door and just begin to walk down the sidewalk toward uh, where my sister and her, her and her family live. And I would pick him up and we'd go on to work at, in Dallas. Because Oswald did not own a car? No, he did not. And um, from talking with him, um, he did not know how to drive a car. Oh, really? Yes. That's interesting. Now, let me ask you this now, because... Um, Here's this man. It's a small town, right? A long time ago, uh, we didn't have a very favorable uh, relationship with the Soviet Union. But here's a, a young man who defected to the Soviet Union and returned. Did he ever mention that to you? No, we never we, we, we never talked about that. Now, I did learn from my sister that um, he had been to Russia, and uh, and while over there. Uh, he he had married a, a young girl, Marina, um, and and they had uh, come back to the states. And um, at that time, I wasn't really inquisitive about uh, what he did in Russia or, or why he went to Russia. Uh, since then, you know, I've, I've learned some things uh, through reading, and um, but. Um, I guess, um, I guess I was just the type of young boy that was. I respected other people's feelings. And Got, I gotcha. I, now that's you, though. But what about other people working there at the Texas School Book Depository? Did, what were other people discussing this? Hey, this young man went to Russia and came back with a wife. What's going on there? Did anybody gossip about that? Well, the thing is, I don't think they found out about that or knew anything about that until after the assassination and. Um, they did. They did uh, uh, talk with Lee from time to time, but um, the uh, thing uh, that I'd like to say is that um, uh, they kind of they kind of made fun of him a little bit by the way he talked. He talked very well. His English was very well hmm. spoken, and and some of uh, the people worked there and didn't have the greatest skills and. Uh, speaking so therefore by that I mean they would be for instance if they were telling something they may uh, use a, a wrong tense or something or, or not phrase something correctly well one day he was talking and and I remember he um, he uh, said a sentence and in that sentence there was a word that I didn't exactly know the meaning, and I said, I need to look that up. So since there at the uh, school book depository, we had many books and many titles. We also had dictionaries. And so <laughs> uh, I went in, uh, to, over to the uh, row there on the first floor and where we had dictionaries, and I got a dictionary out, and, and I found the word, and I read it, and then I put what I read uh, it helped me understand the sentence thoroughly. And while I was doing that, uh, he walks up and he uh, he says, uh, what are you doing? I said, well, I'm checking on a word. I said, you said this sentence, and I repeated it. And I said, I wasn't 
quite sure if I uh, understood or knew the correct meaning of the word. So I said, I'm looking it up. And uh, so he didn't frown or anything. He says, he said, you're very different. Hmm. And, I, and I looked at him and I said, why is that? And he said, because you never make fun of me. And I said, well, that's something that my mother and my grandmother taught me very clearly. You don't make fun of someone if you don't understand them. You try to you, you try to realize uh, what they're telling you and go from there. And I said, that's what I'm doing. Now, now Mr. Frazier, is there anything um, prior to the date of the assassination and you giving him a ride to work that day that you haven't told us that you want the audience to know about? Uh, well, um, it was quite a learning experience working with him and uh, and something that I've never been ashamed of. Uh, it's just part of my life. Um, I think uh, I think the people that uh, purchase the book, whether um, by the book itself, the hardback, or the electronic version, I think I think they'll find the book very interesting. And they might learn some things. Uh, gotcha. And once again, the book is called, um, let me pull this up, uh, Seeking, where is this? Sorry about that. Steering Truth. <laughs> Steering Truth. Steering Truth. My eternal Steering connection. Truth. Steering Truth. Yes. My eternal connection to JFK and Lee Harvey Oswald by Buell Wesley Frazier. And you can find that on Amazon.com. And as also, you can go to Buell Wesley Frazier on Facebook and also see the directions on how to purchase the book. Now, I guess we, the, ne the next stage of the story is the day of the assassination. You had made prior plans you were going to take him to work that morning, correct? Say again, please. Uh, the, the, I guess the next part of the story is the day of the assassination. And you had made prior uh, arrangements with him that you were going to take him to work that morning. Yes. Now, um, on November the 21st, which was a Thursday in 1963, he came up to me. Uh, during the day, and he says, can I ride home with you this afternoon? And I said, sure. Well, uh, a little while later, I was uh, filling the order, and I looked at the date on, on the invoice, and I said to myself, I said, today's not Friday. Hmm. So when I ran into him, I said, hey, I said, you asked me if you could ride home with me, and I told you you could. And I said, are you aware? Today's not Friday. Today's Thursday. And he looked at me and smiled. He says, I know that. I said, well, I just wanted to make sure you didn't think it was Friday. And so I said, well, why would you be wanting to go home today on Thursday? He says, well, he says, Marino has made me some curtains, and I'm going to get some curtain rods from Miss Payne um, and, and take back tomorrow to put up in my uh, room. Uh, where he rented a room at a rooming house. Right. And so I never had been there to the rooming house. I didn't even know where it was. And I did not know that um, there was four windows in his room, and they already had curtain rods and curtains. But I, I learned that much later. I just learned that just now. <laughs> okay, t today o'clock. Yeah. <laughs> I just learned that. I, I had never even thought to ask that question before. Now, um, did he seem like he was making up the story on the spot, or were you suspicious and raising a concern? No, he, he's perfectly his normal self. Gotcha. And uh, my t I, he rode home with me that Thursday. And then the next morning now, he did something different he'd never done before. Okay. As I said previously, I always picked him up at the house or him walking, or just beginning to walk down the sidewalk. Uh, but on November the 22nd, he gets up, he uh, walks down the sidewalk to uh, my sister's home, he crosses the street, he goes over, and he's carrying a package with him, and he puts it in the back seat of my car on the passenger side. Well, then he comes around and he looks in one of the windows there in the kitchen. And so my mother was there with me uh, and uh, my three nieces, we were at the uh, breakfast table eating breakfast. The girls were watching cartoons on the TV 
And my mother looked at me, and she was startled. She said, who's that looking in the window? And so I said, where? And so she said, over by the kitchen sink. So I looked, and there was Lee looking in the window. Well, I get up, and uh, I go to the back door, which opens out onto a double carport, and he comes around. And I said, hey, I said, um, I'm finishing my breakfast. Would you like to come in and have a cup of coffee? He says, no. He said, I'll just wait here for you. And so I close the door. I go back and sit down and finish eating my breakfast and go and brush my teeth. And when I come in back into the kitchen area, my sister's just finishing my lunch, which I always took my lunch every day. And talking about lunches, Lee always... Uh, took a lunch with him every day. Now, on November the 22nd, he did not have a lunch with him. And mm. I noticed that really just a few minutes after we left the house, um, I asked him, I said, where's your lunch? You leave your lunch at home? He said, no. He said, I'm buying my lunch today. Well, when I sat down in the car, we walked uh, from the uh, they were going on to the carport, out to where I parked my car outside the double carport. And as I was sitting down into the uh, car, I glanced over and I saw a package on the back seat. And I, I looked at Lee and I said, what's in the package, Lee? And he says, curtain rods. He said, don't you remember? Uh, we talked about that yesterday. And I said, yes, we did. Well, I never thought any more about it. Um, so that morning, uh, the weather was, uh, it was misty rain, and I'm sure that um, people that have driven a car from time to time, you've seen the mist on the windshield is uh, small like the uh, head of a, a needle, uh, really fine. And uh, so I had to turn my wipers on and off because uh, at that time, the car I was driving in did not have intermittent wipers gotcha so uh and it did this all the way to work it was cloudy you know looked like a typical uh winter day in november and um so we listened to the radio a little bit on the way to work and um um he wasn't real talkative i asked him uh on the way to work i said uh well did you have a good time seeing your wife and his daughter, because Marina was still pregnant with a second child, as you were, uh, she had just had the second child. Uh, so he had two daughters, and I asked him, I said, well, did you have a good time with your wife and the children? And he chuckled and I laughed and said he did. But he didn't. Um, he didn't. He acted perfectly normal like he always does and on the rides and to work on uh, so I didn't think anything about that. Didn't, didn't seem um, nervous or distracted or anything? No. Angry? Perfectly normal. Perfectly normal. No. Not that I could tell. He was his perfect normal self. Yeah. Um, and I, I have said that, you know, he was a big talker, so that didn't bother me any. And what and, about uh, when, when he showed up at work? Did he just get right into his normal routine of doing his assignments? Well, here's the thing. When, where I had to park my car was about a good 250, 300 meters from where we worked. Uh, the the uh, parking lot for the individuals was that far away from the building where we worked. So usually we walked together, but that morning we got there a few minutes earlier, and um, so I was uh, uh, charging the battery on my old car, and at that time, uh, that car had a voltage regulator and a generator. And for people that uh, don't understand this, um, let me explain. If the points in the voltage regulator would stick, your battery could be hot, but by the time you got off work, your battery would be dead. It wouldn't have enough uh, uh, juice in it to start your car. So I was... Um, charging my battery and cars nowadays the voltage regulator and the alternator as you were the generator is all into one 
uh, piece is called an alternator now. And uh, so uh, you don't have that problem about the point sticking. Uh, but um, anyway, I did that, and while I was doing that, he gets out of the car, takes the package out of, out of the car, and uh, stands there for a minute, and then he realizes what I'm doing. So he begins to walk off toward work. And so a short time after a few couple of minutes, I, I started, I cut the car off and got out and started to walk toward where, the building where we work. Well, as I said previously, usually we walk together, but this morning we didn't. He walked ahead of me. The package he was carrying, he had one end in his right hand, cup of his right hand, and the other was under his armpit. Well, he walked ahead of me, and, and I didn't see any reason to check, catch up with him because um, I was watching the uh, the trains that, that we had to walk across a lot of tracks. Mm. Um, that's all gone now because uh, if you come to Dallas, the area has changed a little bit. Uh, but um, he, I did look up and see him walking up the steps on the dock, and he went in to the uh, first floor, and the time I got there, I, I uh, gone and I clocked in, and then I went down to the basement and hung up my jacket and put my lunch. And the thing I liked about the basement, it was always cool. Um, hey, can I ask you a question I mean, real quick? Uh, can you think sure. of a reason why, like, like if, if someone had given me a ride to work and they were going to give me a ride home that night, I would leave the curtain rods in the car. Why, why would you bring them into work with them? Well, uh, I asked him. I'm sorry to, uh, I didn't tell you. Yeah. Uh, I asked him, I said, will you be going home with me tonight? And he says, no. Hmm. And he told me about the lunch. Uh, you're not having a lunch that morning. He said, I'm going to buy my lunch. Well, I didn't think anything about that because we had two uh, sandwich shops within walking distance of the building where we worked, and you could walk over there and get a sandwich on your lunch break. And I didn't think anything about it. And uh, so I get into work. I don't know where he was because I didn't see him for a little while. Um, but um, he, um, when I did uh, see him, he was working, and so was I. And, and so... Uh, we we talked very little that morning because by that time uh, he had really gotten really really good at filling orders. Right. Let, let me ask another right. question real quick before we take a commercial break. Um, obviously, he wasn't carrying the curtain rods around with him all day long. Did he have no. a, a locker or somewhere he could store it? No, we did not have lockers. Okay. Uh, now, I have been asked, uh, well, what do you do with the curtain rods? Yeah. Or the package he said that was curtain rods. Um, I don't know. Okay. Uh, I have been told that there were curtain rods found in the uh, building, but the people that was um, logging the evidence um, didn't remember where they were, there were where they were found and who found them. But I've been told that. Really? Who told but you I, that? But well. Um, Someone that was checking, uh, asked in um, talking to the police department, someone, uh, I think he might have been a reporter or something, asking that question. And they said, well, they didn't remember where they were found. Uh, and it didn't, uh, it wasn't logged into the evidence gotcha. that they found that day. So uh, that's just hearsay. I don't know how true that is. And a I reporter told that, you. I want to make that uh, yeah. perfectly clear. A reporter told uh, you. Well, uh, that's what I was told. Okay. Now, let me ask you this. When was the last time you, you had your eyesight on Mr. Oswald before the assassination? Um, probably within uh, 30, 40 minutes, probably. 30, 40 uh, minutes? It, yeah, 30 to 40 minutes. Because the thing is, we was up and down on different floors, getting books and everything. And gotcha. You might see it. You might, uh, we had two freight elevators. Uh, he might see one, somebody getting on a freight elevator or getting off. So he was working. He, he was working perfectly normal up until thirty minutes before the assassination. Well, 
I, I don't know uh, now. I'm not saying working perfectly normal. Uh, he he worked. Uh, I didn't see anything unusual about right. his work activity. So I, I did see him, you know, there within the hour, as I said, uh, before we we um, got the okay to break for lunch. Okay. And now, when did you become aware that the president had been shot? Well, that was after uh, that was after when when um, when we got the okay that we could go out and watch the parade. Well, normally everybody stopped, and and I myself went out to the front steps of the Texas School Book Depository, which is now the Sixth Floor Museum. Uh, at the time I got there, there was uh, quite a few people from different publishing offices who were already on the steps. And so, being the height I was, I I could stand on the top step right outside the door, and I could see beautifully. And uh, I might add that uh, I was standing there, and then when the uh, parade uh, motor came, uh, turned off of, uh, of Main Street onto Houston Street, and as they were turning off of Houston Street onto Elm, make that left-hand turn there to come by the in front of the building where I was employed, um, I made a, a note to a lady standing next to me. Her name was Sarah Stanton. And I said, look at that. She's beautiful. Mm -hmm. And at that time, we had uh, magazines uh Look in Life magazines, and I have to add that the photographers did a fantastic job because they didn't have near the technology we have today. And how they did that, I don't know. But from seeing pictures of the president and her, uh, and magazines and so forth, it made you almost like you actually personally knew them, which they did not. But I only uh, knew them through pictures. Well, let, me, let me ask you this real quick. Were you aware that the president would be driving by uh, that building before that day? Uh, I was uh, t I was told that that morning. That morning. Um, that morning because Junior Jarman, a man that uh, worked there, he bought a, a, a newspaper every morning while waiting for the bus. Most of the people worked in that building uh, got to work by riding a bus. Right. Uh, you know, Mr. Truly and Mr. Case and Mr. Shelley, they had a, they had a, um, they had kind of like a carport right off uh, one of the docks we had, and and that was unusual because uh, if you didn't have their status, you didn't have a parking place there. Gotcha. Now, and, um, how how did you first come to learn that, that Mr. Kennedy was shot? You you witnessed it with your, your own eyes? Well, the the uh, way I. I um, realized that was that uh, now I have to add that when the uh, motorcade was being led by motorcycle policemen mm. and um, they were cutting their motorcycles on and off and causing them to backfire and so I thought that was unusual but I said well well I guess they're just kind of showing off and didn't think much about it well after the motorcade passed by me and then I heard a a loud noise, and at first I thought it was just another motorcycle backfire. But then, shortly after that, there were two more shots, and the last two shots were closer together than the first. Gotcha. Well, I realized then, from being a, a boy growing up in the country, and I used to love to hunt, that I realized that that wasn't motorcycle backfire. That was actually that was actually um, gunshot. Someone firing uh, a weapon. Now, Mr. Frazier, Rifle. this is the first I've ever heard of motorcycle backfires that day. How many motorcycle backfires did you hear? Well, I don't know how many there was because before they made the turn off of Houston Street on to Elm, there they were uh, they were different uh, motorcycle police were cutting their bikes on and off. There was several. Times, but I didn't think anything about it. Like I said previously, I just thought maybe they were just kind of showing off. Sure, know? sure. And 
Now, now and, you, you hear stories too about how the the, uh, the motorcade paused or stopped for a few seconds. Did you witness that? Well, when you make that uh, sharp left hand turn off of uh, Pew Street onto Elm to go down to the triple underpass uh, to go out onto the um, the freeway, it's a real sharp turn and. Um, as you well know, a limo is a lot longer than a normal car. So, therefore, I, uh, you have to uh, uh, take the uh, turn a little slower. It didn't stop. It was just a, they just slowed down. And and, um, and, and did that so, coincide with the with the gunshots? Well, um, the um, the motorcade made the left hand turn, and after it got past. Um, where I could no longer see because uh, I have to let the listeners know that the streets were lined with lots of people. Um, and so therefore I could see after the motorcade went past my line of sight, all I could see was people standing on the sidewalk, you know, several, you know, deep, and you couldn't see. So I didn't think anything about that. But then when it got down past where I could no longer see, then I heard I heard the first uh, the first shot, which I said I thought was a motorcycle bike car. Hmm. And then uh, then later there was short time later there was two close much closer together than between the first and second shot. But uh, the way I found out that the president had been shot. A lady had been down on the sidewalk, uh, and she come running up, and she was crying. And and so she said that they shot the president. Well, I turned to Sarah Stanton, the lady next to door, and I said, what did that lady say? She says, she said they shot the president. And so I said to myself, wow. I said, boy. You know, I, you know, you wouldn't expect, I wouldn't expect anything like that, and I don't think anybody else was. Now, now so, you hear people telling a story about when the people were pointing toward the grassy knoll, and everybody thought the shots were coming from over there. Did you witness anything like that? Well, let me explain something. Uh, Dealey Plaza is closed on three sides and open on one. And that time of year in November, when the wind is swirling and everything, mm. uh, you can hear a sound. And it's similar to like uh, being in a canyon. When you hear something, you know how it ricochets. Gotcha. And 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 that's why some people say there were a lot more shots than three, because of the sound ricocheting off the buildings and the wind swirling. Um, but on record, it only it, they only have three shots. Gotcha. Now, when is the first time you came? When, when, did you go back to work? What happened after this? Well, um, I stood there on the steps because uh, very quickly after the uh, third shot, a very short time, um, one of the um, motorcycle policemen, um, I think his name was Marion Baker, um, he he comes up the steps uh, where I was standing there. He already had his pistol drawn. Mm. Well, Mr. Truly, the um, warehouse manager, uh, he goes with him into the building, and um, they go into the building. And how they end up on the second floor, I don't know. I don't know whether they took the elevator or they went across uh, the uh, first uh, floor there and went up the stairs. I don't know. Uh, but they, once they got on the second floor, uh, they were there at the uh, lunch room, which was uh, close to the elevator shaft there, uh, and the stairway. Uh, they encountered a young man there uh, at the uh, Coke machine. Right. That young man was Lee Harvey Oswald. Now, let me ask you this. Did anybody else stay within the building and not go outside to watch the motorcade besides Oswald? Uh, now, I have heard there, there were, but I do not, I, I don't I don't know who they were or what office they worked in. I don't know. Um, I know Jack Daughtery had uh, several 
accounts, he told he said that he was inside the building. Uh, so I don't know. Okay. Uh, some people were up on the fifth floor watching the parade uh, that worked there in the uh, warehouse. Uh, but the thing is, um, when Marion Baker and, uh, and Mr. Truly encountered uh, Lee there, he was there at the uh, uh, soda machine uh, getting a uh, soda, a Coke. And um, But over at a table a short distance from where he was standing, there was a uh, half-eaten cheese sandwich and a partially eaten apple. And so the uh, motorcycle policeman asked him, I asked Mr. Truly, he said, do you, do you know him? And he says, oh, yes, he works here. So they went on, wherever they went on, I don't know, and their search. But... Um, But what I did after the uh, shooting was um, Mr. Shirley and uh, my friend Billy Lovelady, they had uh, taken off down toward the triple underpass where the president was shot. And so two or three minutes after that, I said, well, I'm going to go see where they are and see what, what they're doing. Well, I started down that way, and there was so much... Um, people running and hollering and screaming. I said, I'm never going to find him. Mm. So I turned around and I walked back to um, the corner uh, of um, Elm and Houston, and there was uh, several people, two or three people standing there, and we were just talking, and um, then I turned, and I was looking up Houston Street, Along beside the um, the uh, Texas School Book Depository, uh, the man walking along beside the building was Lee Harvey Oswald. Hmm. Now, and, uh, can, can you, can you c- confirm for me? Then, did you make arrangements that you were going to take him home that night or not? Uh, I asked him uh, earlier in the day would he be going home that night, and he said no. And so, uh, right. So I didn't think anything about it. I didn't ask. I I didn't know where he had something already planned that he was doing or gotcha, what. Gotcha. I just, so I you just saw, never you, got into that. You saw him after the shooting, walking by the building. Was he walking briskly? Did he look nervous? What was going on over there? He was, he was just walking normally, he was very casually. And was he and walking he, away from work? Well, here's the thing. Uh, when I looked, I saw him come come around off of the dock there and walking up Houston Street and I noticed him and I thought he was probably going to walk up to me and uh, a couple of other people standing there at the corner of uh, Elm and Houston but he didn't he he didn't walk all the way up to uh, go across the crosswalk normal he, you know, he cut across and got into the crosswalk went across Houston Street and once he got across Houston Street, then he crossed Elm. Well, about half, he's about halfway across the street, and somebody said something to me, and I turned to see who was speaking to me, and I answered them. And then when I turned back, he was—I lost him in the crowd. Okay, well, let's let me try this. Okay, originally when I uh, booked you for this interview, I asked you for fifty-five minutes, but we're going to need more time. Can you give me more time? I can give you a little bit more. Time. <laughs> okay, a little bit more. Oh, by the way, I was going to ask you this: Was it unusual for Oswald to exit the building via that loading dock you described? Well, uh, no, because usually that's the way we would exit the uh, building when he was riding home with me. Gotcha. On Friday afternoon, or uh, so. No, seeing him uh, go across uh, uh, Houston Street and then crossing Elm uh, wasn't anything unusual, and I didn't think anything about it because what I thought about, as I said earlier, that we have two sandwich shops, and there was two sandwich shops in the area at that time, and so I thought he was just going to get him a sandwich. Gotcha. Now, after the shooting, were there any other employees there that didn't come back to work? or uh, Not that I know of. 
Now, the thing is, um, after uh, after that, uh, uh, people began to mill around and went back in the building. And um, I um, I realized, being a young boy, I realized I had to eat my lunch. Mm-hmm. So, and being a, a young 19-year-old kid, you're always hungry. So I uh, go back in the building, go down into the basement, uh, get my lunch, and I'm sitting up on a pallet of books. And I, I had a book that I was interested in. And one of the things I used to do while I was taking my lunch break, um, I would uh, often uh, be reading in a book and eating my lunch. Uh, and that's the way I learned about the, uh, the contents of a lot of the books we sold. And I enjoyed it very thoroughly, and it was quiet. Um, there was a lunch room up on the first floor where the guys played uh, cards and dominoes, and he's very loud in there. And, and I, I tried eating lunch in there one time, and I said, that's not for me. So I uh, picked up eating my lunch down in the basement. And I was doing that, and uh, so I was reading, and I looked up, and um, I had heard someone come down. Uh, we had two ways to get down in the basement. You could, uh, as, as you were, um, there's actually three ways. You could come down on the freight elevator. You could come down on a stairway over uh, close to the elevator shaft, or you could go down the stairs right there by the belt that went up uh, to the first floor. Well, anyway, I was uh, reading, I looked up, and I saw this policeman. And he was staring me down, and I looked up, and he said, so. He said, you been down there very long? I said, not too long. He said, have you heard anybody come down? I said, well, if somebody came down the stairs uh, over by the elevator a few minutes ago, but I said, I didn't pay that much attention. I didn't see anyone. So it must have been him, and he told me it was him. And so I told him how to get back up to the first floor easier than the way he had gotten down there. And uh, so I went on, finished eating my lunch, and read and was reading, and then I realized how quiet it was. I said, something's not right. So I put the book down, and, and I go back up to the first floor from the basement, and... Uh, and people were beginning to congregate there on the first floor, and, and what we, what actually happened, they had people there in the building down on the first floor, and we had a roll call. And uh, and when the roll call was over, everyone was there except Lee. Mm. But I didn't think anything about that because I, I saw him going across the street, and I said, well, there was a sandwich shop over in that direction, so I figured he'd gone over there to get him a sandwich. And so shortly after the roll call was over, they said due to what had happened that day that uh, we were not going to be doing any more work that afternoon and that um, we would resume normal activities on Monday morning. And so uh, we left and uh, people went their own ways and whatever they had to do and or wherever they had to go. And uh, so I got in my car and and I was on the way out to Irving, and my stepfather was in the hospital over in Irving, so I looked at my watch, and I said, oh, gosh, it's so much earlier than normal. I said, oh, I'll go by and check on him for my mother. And uh, so I did that, and I got to the hospital, and I was in there checking on him, and a nurse had changed the, uh, they was feeding him, giving him some of those veins, uh, and so she was changing the um, amount of drops per minute. And so she told me, she said, since you have a watch, she says, can you can you tell me how many drops per minute? I'll be right back. Mm-hmm. Well, I was doing that, and then the phone rang in the room, and I answered it. It was a lady at the uh, desk, and she says, do you have, a, uh, you have a phone call? I said, well, just patch it through here to the room, I says. She says, well, I'm new. I don't know exactly how to do that. And so she says, can you come to the front desk and take the call? I said, yes, I'll be there shortly. And I told her what I was doing. Well, 
I told my stepfather, I said, I'll be right back. Well, I opened the door, uh, going out of the room, and once I opened the door, I was grabbed by uh, two plainclothes detectives, and they threw me up against the wall, and they were starting to put the cuffs on me, and I was so uh, I was so excited. I, I didn't have an idea what was going on. I said, hey, I said, what's going on here? So they said, we're arresting you. I said, for what? I said, I haven't done anything. And then they told me they was arresting me and taking me downtown Dallas. So I asked them, I said, please don't put the cuffs on me. I said, I have not done anything. I said, I'll go with you. We'll go to the police department in a few minutes. They'll see that um, there's nothing here, and and I'll be released, and uh, and I'll be on my way. But we left the hospital and then we went by uh, my sister's uh, brother-in-law's home and they asked me says uh, do you have any do you have any firearms I said I do and they said what is that I said well I have a double barrel shotgun a 16 gauge um, 1891 Stevens or 36 inch barrels and um, and I also have a rifle they said, what is that? And I said, it's a British Enfield 303. Well, they said, do you have that here? I said, yes, sir. And so I showed them where I kept it in the closet. And they said, do you have any ammunition for this? I said, I do. And I showed them that. Well, they confiscated that, both of the shotgun and the um, rifle and ammunition. And so they said, well, we're going to stop by the urban police department and so they talked to a sergeant there and told him what was going on they were taking me downtown Dallas and we left there and we got down to the police station and um, they told me beforehand they said there's a lot of people and they'll be there and said there'll be reporters don't say anything well we got in there 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 was so many people you could hardly walk down the hallway and they took me down to this um one room and uh, Detective Rose and Detective Stovall was the two um, detectives that arrested me and, and so we went into this little room and that's when the interrogation started and this went on for a couple of hours uh, questions over and over they'd ask you a question and answer them and then a few minutes later they'd ask the, they'd answer, they would ask the same question but uh a little different, or a little different, but the answer would should be the same. And no. so this went on for, like I said, a couple of hours. And so they looked at one another, and so they took a break. And another set of detectives came in, and um, they started all over again. And and they left, and and then Rose and Stovall came back in and went on another session, and and so been talking for a long time and was just, my mouth was so dry and thirsty I asked her I have a cup of water I asked could I have could I have some water well if you familiar with um, the styrofoam cups they have a lot of offices you got uh, three different sizes well the smallest one I got a half a cup of water mm -hmm. and <clears throat> it's like not even having anything in your mouth my mouth was so dry and they left and then come in come uh, <coughs> uh, uh, Will Fritz. He was a head of homicide. He was Captain Captain Will Fritz. He comes in and he has a typed confession. He puts that down on the table and a pen. He said, "Here, sign this." Well, I started to read it and. And I looked up, I said, I'm not signing this. I said, this is ridiculous. Well, he's standing to my left. And so he draws his right hand up to hit me. And I uh, put my left arm up to block. And I told him, I said, um, there's policemen outside that door over there. But I said, before they get in there, I said, you and I are going to have a hell of a fight. And I said, I'm going to get some good licks in on you. Well... He snatches up the confession 
and a pen and stomps out of the room. And I never did see him again. I never have talked to him or seen him since. Um, and uh, what did the confession say? Well, the confession said that I was I, I knew of and 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 I was part of the assassination. And he was ridiculous. And I wasn't gonna I wasn't gonna sign that. Mm. He was the first thing from the truth. So what happens next? Then, uh, then they uh, decided. Uh, they told me they was going to let me go home. Well, my sister was there at the police station also, and uh, so we were in the back seat, uh, and we were going out uh, uh, I thirty five E. Uh, which is Simmons Freeway, and we got out to about um, Inwood, Mockingbird area, and so they got a call and said, bring him back. So um, they brought me back to the police station there in Dallas, and um, and there um, they fingerprinted me and did a bug shot and uh, gave me a polygraph test. Well, if you question them today, you know, they'll deny they did any of that, but they did happen. Mm. And um, so after that, uh, they they said we could go home. Um, and so they took me back out to my sister and I out to my car there in Irving at the hospital. And I was getting out of the car and I noticed the uh, back seat of my car was all messed up. And I turned to one of the detectives and I said, what happened here? They said, oh, by the way, said, we forgot to tell you. We searched your car before we came in to arrest you. And I said, at least you could have put the seat back the way it was. Well, they didn't offer. So I had to put the seat back in. And, um, and my sister and I got in my old car and which was a black 1954 Chevy, Chevrolet. And we, uh, and we drove home. And uh, we got out and went into the house, and we were so scared. Um, I slept on a sofa in the living room of the house. And uh, so when right on the corner when lights would turn and lights would actually turn a car turning would come into the um, living room I was off the floor I was off the sofa on the floor um, this happened many nights I was so scared uh, so we didn't get home until Saturday morning they picked me up they picked me up mid afternoon and I was there we didn't get home there after 1 o'clock, uh, between 1 and 2, somewhere in there. And so I um, was so scared, couldn't really sleep. And, but later that day, Saturday, I went out to uh, check something on my car. I don't know. I was doing something. And so I heard my sister. She opened the, the door to the car park, and she says, where are you? I said, I'm out here at the car. He says, come here. Well, I walked around my car going to the carport, which I was out in the wide open. She told me, she says, there's a car down there. And it was a car down past the intersection. <clears throat> and uh, so there's a man sitting in it. And uh, so she said, get in here. Well, I saw the men get out of the car, and the man had a rifle. Wow. <laughs> and um, so uh, he uh, he gets back in the car, and we watch through the window. We call, my sister calls the, uh, she calls the Irving police. Uh, sometime later, uh, a police car comes up, and they... Uh, he never gets out of the uh, 
he never gets out of the uh, car, but he talks to the person in the other car and and the police car drives off and a few minutes the car where the man had the rifle uh, he drives off and I never seen the, the man that was in the car with the rifle never seen him since did you ever find out who it was? no and the thing is we we, we, we called the we called the Dallas police uh, not the Dallas police but the Irving police they never they never gave us any feedback on that. Hmm. So my sister and I, we were very scared. Has that been mentioned in any other JFK books or movies or anything? Say that again, please. Yeah, this incident you described with a man with a rifle parked down your block, has that ever been described in another book, another publication besides yours, or in a movie or anything about the JFK assassination? This is the first time hearing about it. Not, not that I know of, because a lot of people don't know about that. Right. You know, I'm, I, I know. <laughs> I'm hearing for the first time again. This is great stuff. So, so nothing ever became of that. You were never shot at. Say again, please. Did, were you ever shot at or beat up or anything like that? No, but I was very ter- I was very terrified. I was very. Um, I really, I really was drawn into a shell. Mm. And I was leery of people, and I I didn't trust people, and I I didn't trust the police because the way I'd been treated by them. And here I was a young boy right. from a small rural town, little town, and I never had been in any problems at all. Let me let me and, ask you this: the the, uh, the shooting of Jack Ruby was this prior to or after this incident with the man with the rifle? It was. Um, the man with the rifle on the street was prior. Okay, so then what? Then I guess the day you found out that Jack Ruby was shot, you must have again. Well, uh, the man with the rifle was on um, on Saturday, uh, November the twenty third, when that happened. Right, nineteen sixty three. Um, Jack uh, Jack Ruby Jack Ruby uh, was in the basement and. Um, and he shot, uh, fatally shot uh, Lee Oswald uh, when he was, as he came off the elevator uh, in the basement of the Dallas Police Headquarters there in Dallas. Um, and uh, and then, of course, they arrested uh, Jack Ruby. Uh, So and, uh, that must have terrified you as well when you saw that uh, Oswald was shot by Ruby. Yes. At uh, that point, what did, what did you think? Were you can at that point the the day that the, uh, Oswald gets shot? Did you think he was guilty for the murder of JFK or not? Uh, no, I do not think he was guilty of that. And I'd like to add that if people do their research, they will find that um, Lee Oswald never appeared in a court before a judge and a jury. Right. Lee, Os- Lee, Oswald, Lee Harvey Oswald was never convicted of anything. Not even not even the uh, uh, Tippett. The shooting of, um, of uh, Tippett. Uh, the Dallas Police Officer. Uh, at, the ti- at the time you were being questioned about you know driving Oswald and all this interrogation overnight coming back, taking your prints, did they ever mention Tippett to you at all? Did they ever mention again, please? Tippett. No, they never did mention Tippett. That whole time they never once questioned you about Tippett? No, never. Did they ever question you about Tippett? Never. Amazing. We only have about another 10, 15 minutes in this segment, and I would like to schedule you to come back. Okay. In your lifetime of living with this, what do you think happened? Well, there's a lot of scenarios people mm-hmm. could come up with. Uh, you now, for a long time, as I said, I just shut down and I just shut things out of my mind. I was I was so terrified and so scared, um, not trusting anyone, and certainly not a 
a policeman. Um, it was a very, a very dark time for me, a very frightening time for me and my family because we didn't know what was going on. Uh, we knew this was a lot larger and more to it than, than we knew. And a lot of people still have an, uh, questions and answers today. Well, what about this or what about that? But um, what I will tell people in regards to Lee Harvey Oswald was that all you can legally say is that he was the alleged assassin. He never was convicted of, of anything. Um, and the children in the neighborhood out in Irving, there were Marina lived with uh, uh, Bruce Payne. There's a big oak tree in that yard. It's still there today. All the kids in the neighborhood, Friday was a special day because that was the last day of school for the week. And they also knew that Mr. Lee would be coming coming to Irving. And all the kids in the neighborhood loved him. And uh, hearing my little nieces, the three little nieces talk about him. They really loved him and they enjoyed the games he played with them around the big oak tree. And, um, and to hear the people the other things they say about him and people never having the opportunity to meet him or talk to him or, or work with him I, I wonder how someone could do that uh, Real quick because we are running out of time I know you have an appointment have you ever uh, met or spoken to Judith Baker Brown claim she was the girlfriend of uh, Lee Harvey Oswald I, I know who she is yeah. I don't know her real well but I do know who she is. And she has a, um, she puts on a kind of a seminar every right. November in Dallas. But uh, knowing her really well now, I have read that that she says that she and uh, uh, Lee was big boyfriend, girlfriend, when they lived in New Orleans, working for the uh, coffee company. Do you think that's a possibility? I don't know. Uh, since, you know, I wasn't there, and uh, I have no idea. Um, okay. Well, okay, we'll revisit that on another day. We, we are out of time. What would you like to leave us with? Well, what I'd like to leave uh, your listeners with that I really enjoyed uh, talking with you, Mr. Opperman. Uh, this morning um, and uh, if I can help people try to understand something I will uh, to the best of my ability but um, hopefully hopefully someday they'll, they'll have all the pieces to the puzzle and, and they'll solve this thing uh, it's, a, it's a crime of the century yeah, I would say so as well. Okay, we have been speaking to, uh, to put it lightly, uh, Buell Wesley Frazier. You can go to Facebook, type in Buell Wesley Frazier, B-U-E-L-L -L, Wesley Frazier with a Z, and you'll come up with the, the Facebook page for the book, Steering Truth, My Eternal Connection to JFK and Lee Harvey Oswald. And you can find that book on Amazon and Barnes & Noble. Uh, hopefully we'll be having Mr. Frazier back. Uh, to, to elaborate more on this story. Thank you so much. Well, thank you for having me this morning, and uh, I hope the people that take the time to order uh, the book, uh, regardless where it's the electronic version or the book, uh, I hope that the time they spend reading it uh, and the monetary value they pay for it, I hope they, they think their time is well spent. Um, it's a book that worked on for a long, long time. Yeah, a lot of uh, exclusive, uh, never-before-told information. Steering Truth, My Eternal Connection to JFK and Lee Harvey Oswald by Buell Wesley Frazier. Thank you so much, sir. All right. Well, thank you kindly. Good night.